Let's give her a confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Let's greet each other. May, may we give all glory and thanksgiving to the Lord. With this, today's message is entitled The Rediscovery of Thanksgiving. Today is Thanksgiving Sunday, a day to give thanks and glory to God. In the Old Testament, there were three festivals for the Israelites to thank God for His guidance and blessings. It is the Passover, the Feast of Ingathering, and the Feast of Harvest. And among these feasts, the Feast of Harvest is the Thanksgiving Lord's Day that we celebrate today. Israel harvests three times a year, and these harvest seasons are connected to the three holidays. The harvest of winter barley is the Passover. The harvest of the summer barley and wheat is the Feast of Ingathering. And the harvest of olives and grapes is the Feast of Harvest. The Feast of the Harvest was a time when the Israelites would finish harvesting in the fall and gather their grain, store it in the barns, and give thanks to God for all the harvest that they had at that time. It is also known as the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths because of its connection to thanking God for saving and guiding the Israelites throughout history. It also commemorates God's grace that preserved and protected them in the wilderness for 40 years after the Exodus. So whatever you call it, the important thing that we must focus on is that the Israelites connected all things to gratitude and thanksgiving, not connecting it to unbelief and resentment, but all pain and difficulty and everything before God, they connected it to thanksgiving. Being a child of God, we already have received the greatest gift of our lives. We've already received the greatest gift of our lives. We are children of God. We are people of God. We are citizens of heaven. Therefore, our walk of faith should be a life of thanksgiving. Let's read say this together. A walk of faith is a walk of thanksgiving. A sociologist once said, our age has a disease worse than cancer. And that disease and illness is thanksgiving frigidity, which means they lack thanksgiving. What's worse than cancer, the leading cause of death is the illness that people don't know how to be thankful. The modern people, why are they unhappy? The reason they're unhappy is because they lack thanksgiving. They have no gratitude in their life. That's why they're bound to be unhappy. The reformer Martin Luther once said, only the devil's world is without gratitude, he said. In the devil's world, there is no thanksgiving. Someone who's seized by the devil has no thanksgiving. They only have complaint and resentment and unbelief. Someone who is always bound by an environment of unbelief, they have no thanksgiving. Look at it closely. Successful people, people who have a bit of, a, of blessings or people who are doing well according to worldly standards, if you look at them, they don't really have a lot of complaints. They always have gratitude in their hearts. But people who are sick and poor, you, they usually have a lot of complaints. But that only worsens their situation. There are, there are these things called reactive oxygen species, which are 
extra unhealthy oxygen produced during the oxidation of oxygen that you breathe into your body. And these are unhealthy extra oxygen, which are called reactive oxygen species. These species, they attack the body's normal cells and contribute to aging and various diseases. And it's oxygen, but it's incorrect oxygen. And they're so harmful that about 90% of modern diseases have been linked to them. And that's why to us it's not it's a very harmful, damaging cell. However, certain things encourage their production, things that enhance and increase the, the production of these reactive oxygen harmful species is hatred, anxiety, self-deprecation, resentment, and guilt. In those individuals, these species are often more active. So they can't be healthy. They can't have a good well-being. But there is a secret to boosting your immune system, improving your blood circulation, and keeping yourself healthy. And that is a life of thanksgiving. This, these are words of experts. This is all based on research, expert research. So for you to have that sincere thanksgiving, people who have that are healthy. And they don't have minor sicknesses here and there. And even their life goes smoothly. And so, you know, when you live your life, you'd, like, you'd want to meet someone who's positive, right? Would you want to meet someone who's negative? It goes the same for God. And that is why the Bible continuously, repeatedly talks about a life of thanksgiving. You must live a life that gives thanks. It emphasizes that. In today's passage, the Apostle John gives us a basic and essential reason why we should be thankful. What is the standard of your thanksgiving? Is it materialistic things? Is it fame? Is it power? or getting into a good college? Or is it for your business to go well? Or for you to get employed to a good job? Or to get a promotion? Or is it a bigger business that you opened up? Yes, those things are means to give thank be thankful for, but those should not be the standard of your thanksgiving because those are bound to collapse at some point. Through today's word, you must realize why we must live a life of thanksgiving as Christians. We must know the true reason for thanksgiving in our lives. May you discover that through today's word. Then point number one, the restored identity. Verse one says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. The Apostle John very confidently talks about his restored identity with the greatest pride. He says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. John used to be a fisherman. A fisherman now became an apostle and had become a child of God. Empowered by God's great love, we have been given great privilege 
no one just worships, but to have to come on a Lord's Day and worship, it is not an average privilege. It is you must be chosen by God to be able to do that. You need to have been predestined and chosen long before creation to come before God and worship. And what, that's why what is Apostle John's confession? He was so moved <coughs> that he is a child of God. May you have that heart. At first glance, verse 1 may s convey a simple message. But the original text of verse 1 reveals much more depth. The phrase, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, uses the word potapen for what great. It, is, it means an unexpressible amazement and wonder. It means amazement and wonder. That's what it describes. So simply put, if you look at Matthew 8.27, the disciples marveled after Jesus rebuked the stormy sea and made it calm, saying, uh, when there was a storm and, and Jesus came on to them, and when he said, when Jesus calmed the sea and ocean through his word at that time, what does the disciple? What do the disciples say? They say, "What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him." And that is the word potapen. that same word is used here when they were amazed looking at Jesus God sent his only son Jesus Christ for mankind who by disobeying God's word became separated from him and had no worthiness of their own by shedding all his blood every single drop he made us children of God and that amazing love cannot be described by any words of man do we just say thank you with that expression suffice all I've done is sin and yet Christ has forgiven all of my sins and took all my sins upon himself and if you look at the passage it says given it may not move us that deeply <laughs> but in the original text it carries the image of rain pouring down from the sky the apostle John says that God's love has been poured out onto us like torrential rain, completely soaking us. And so we too have been saved like Apostle John. But how is it that the Apostle John has such great and in-depth thanksgiving for the salvation they've re he's received but how come we have nothing like that we're all based on the physical and the introductory things and because of that we've lost hold of that tremendous thanksgiving the apostle john what does he call it he says he feels this overwhelming joy even more deeply as time passes. It wasn't that he lost that sense as time went by on, but instead, it was the opposite. He 
was nine years old when he recorded this, and all the other disciples had already passed, but even while living a life for more than 90 years, he says he expresses that he's experiencing God's love even greater in death. And he encourages us to live with such joy, thanksgiving, in, for the salvation that we've received, with, and if that becomes our standard, and if we have such thanksgiving and joy, then no matter what problem, event, or hardship, we will not be discouraged or despaired, but instead we will face them with faith, challenge with faith, like eagles mounted on their wings. This is the true reflection of a saved child of God. If you rediscover the value of having become a child of God, then you will instead give even greater thanksgiving in your hardships and trials. And you will shine your light even in hardship, even in hardship. You do not give up and complain and resent, but in that, those hardships, if you look at the hymn where my life is smooth in my, my life, the path that I go upon is smooth and calm, but after that lyrics it says great storms and dangers come but still he, the hymn lyrics goes on and says it is well with my soul even if great storms and hardships were to come it is well with my soul Nothing has changed. It's not that my circumstances have changed, but it is well with my soul. That is the gospel. That is the attitude of a child of God. That is the power of the gospel. You tackle and address those problems and fight a spiritual battle. May you become people of faith such as that. And there is another word that we must focus on, and that is the word see in verse 1. In Greek, it is idete, which is an interjection. It's an exclamation. But what is interesting is that in the New Testament it only uses that term with things that are visible but yet here the Apostle John says see what does the Apostle John say he says see that we have become children of God he proclaims it he says see But unbelievers in the world, they will not know this truth. Unbelievers will not be able to understand this sermon I'm preaching. Those who are not saved will not understand this. John notes that unbelievers in the world do not understand this because they do not have the eye to see that. Therefore, they do not recognize our new identity because they lack the eyes of faith. However, those of us, we who have the eyes of faith, must look at each other and confirm our identity as children of God. To the person next to you, let us greet each other. I see that you are a child of God. And to don't say it to yourself, to someone else you need to say, I see you are a child of God. Do not be awkward about it. 
but maybe confident. Confident. This wonderful identity that God has given to you. Whether you failed, whether you're sick, whatever circumstances you may be in, it doesn't matter. Who, are, who am I? May you be strengthened. If you discover your identity, then all forces of darkness crumble and God gives you new strength. And with just this great identity, you can live a life of thanksgiving. C.S. Lewis, a professor at Oxford University, who is a famous theologian, writer, And he was actually originally a materialist and an agnostic who claimed that there is no God. He was, he was atheist and who d he didn't believe that there is a God, but one day he came to believe in Jesus. After his conversion, Professor Lewis played a major role as a leading Christian apologist and one of his autobiographies deeply moves us and that the title of his book is Surprised by Joy. He talks about how by believing in Jesus Christ how he, he expresses his joy the joy that came to him when he became a child of God by believing in Jesus Christ. The fact that God had chosen him long before creation and God, how God had come to him even though he had left Christianity and how God bestowed upon him this tremendous grace, he said that was so unexpected. And he did not expect that he would become a child of God. And I'm sure that even among you, there are those who may give that confession. How is it that I'm seated in this place right now? How did I become a child of God? And how am I worshiping right now? Perhaps there is that unexpected joy and surprising joy within you. Among us, there are those who used to be shamans possessed by demons and who destroyed all shrines through our shaman camp team. We have, our church has a separate shaman church for those who used to be once uh, shamans, and so it's a more specialized ministry that we do. And we have, we have different churches in our, in our church, specialized ministries like North Korean fugitive churches, those who are in difficulty. And we come together, we worship, and we comfort each other. How is it that in this situation, I'm able to worship? That surprising, unexpected joy the fact that I'm a child of God. If you have, if you're deeply moved by that, and if you have that joy, now, to others, may you share that unexpected joy with others like C.S. Lewis and become children of God who relay that joy to others. Point number two is the privilege the privilege of living hope. Let's look at verse 2 to 3. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure. The Apostle John reveals in two ways how the lives of believers who become children of God because 
Uh, how the lives of people, of believers, to become children of God, are have to become different because of two things, and that's first, it is because we have a special, we have a special privilege, a special right as children of God, and that is that when Jesus comes again, we will be like Him. It says. This doesn't mean that we will be just like Jesus, but what that means is when Jesus, in Jesus' second coming, we will, it says that we will also be transformed as glorious bodies. It's a different body than what we have right now. At, in that moment, there is no such thing as sickness or disabilities, but we will be transformed into bodies glorious bodies and it says we also in Philippines 3.21 it says that we will also become resur resurrected glorious bodies we will completely be transformed and those who have this living hope of eternity is not swayed by the introduc introductory things of this world. They're not swayed by the words of man. They're not shaken by that. Those things that will disappear in the world, the temporary things, no matter how hard and difficult our situation may be, we must praise God and praise and give thanks to Him because we have this living hope within us. We're only merely living introductory lives. But sh should we be giving up on our lives because of this and that? Should we not be able to enjoy this identity and right because of the introductory things? We now have less than two months left of this year. Enlarge the place of your tent. God gave us this word that will surely be fulfilled, and we've held on to that, and we've also challenged ourselves in faith holding on to that. For the past 10 months, look at all the covenants, the words of the covenant that God's given to you after God spoke to you and said enlarge the place of your tent look at what kind of covenants God has given to you each week if you go into the internet it all is all in there look at them what kind of answers you have received thus far what kind of changes you've met in your life and may you have the time to give thanks if you look for things to complain about then one day your hope disappears. But if you look for things to be grateful about, then despair disappears. People who complain don't have hope. But to people who give thanks, God gives them hope. In a life of thanksgiving, living hope comes upon them, and God allows that individual to bear abundant fruit. And second, children of God should live a different life from the unbelievers of the world because it says, and everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as he is pure. Jesus is sinless. Therefore, even children of God should live purely without sinning just as Jesus had done. However, despite the principle that believers should not sin, we are still human beings who have the possibility of sinning because we live in a world of unbelief where sin is rampant. And that is why the Apostle John gives an additional explanation in verses 4 to 6. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him 
keeps on sinning, no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. You must understand and interpret this word correctly. And what that means is, those who are in Christ Jesus may sin. They might sin, but they cannot continue repeatedly sin, like habitually sin. For example, someone who continuously steals in their place, in their workplace, and they continue to, to steal just because no one knows in their, at, at, in their job, then those individuals are not children of God. Because you're continuously practicing sinning. If you continuously sin, then that is not. If you continuously commit crimes, then that individual cannot be called a child of God because for a child of God they do not continuously commit sins nor do they despair because they've committed a crime but they repent through Jesus Christ and it said that the reason Jesus came was to destroy the works of the devil that leads us to sin and therefore may you call upon and rely on Jesus who has destroyed the devil and therefore we must not repeat a life of sinning the story contains an important spiritual truth that allows us to obey God's word this one young boy was playing with a young girl was playing with her friends and she remembered her father's instruction to return home by 10 p.m. So she told her friends that she needed to go home. And she said, oh, my dad said I need to come home until 10. And uh, her friend, her friends teased her saying, are you afraid of your dad? And the girl replied, no, it's not because I'm afraid of him, but because I love him. Because I love my dad. It's because I love my dad. There's an important spiritual truth in here. In your heart. If you truly have a heart that loves God, then you are bound to naturally obey God's word. It's very simple. No matter how much Satan tries to deceive you, if you love God, then you will obey the word of God. Not because you're, you fear punishment or because of some guilty conscience. Not with some type of legalistic mindset. You must break free from that. Oh, because I'm afraid of being punished or because I feel guilty or because of my legalistic mindset. No. But instead, it is because we love God. Amen. Because you love God. That's where it must start. Because you love God. Because I'm so grateful that He has given me this living hope. May you obey God's word and have that nature of thanksgiving. And because we love God, what's within us, we have this hope. And so we must have that gospel nature where that obeys the word. And so the individual who, the most daring individual is the one who disobeys the word of God or those who try to destroy the church of God. Those are very daring individuals. How is it that you try to destroy the church that God has established? And that is why in your lives, continuously, many people, many souls need to come and be revived through you. May you be main figures of field transformation. In psychology, this is the conclusion, in psychology, there is a theory called negative distortion. 
According to this theory, the human heart naturally perceives incoming stimuli negatively rather than positively. So what that means is to any outward to any outward influence, most people have negative thoughts that come to mind rather than positive thoughts. And the fundamental reason of that is Genesis 3. D due to the sin of Adam that, was, that he committed in Genesis 3, because we're all born as sinners, and because we're born with that sinful nature, we're we are more con persuaded and convinced by negative words. And it is also that we instead live a life of negativity instead of positivity. We are more inclined or we are more familiar with that. And because of Genesis 3, each all human beings live a life contrary to God's original design, a life that's opposite to the Word of God. It's the same even now. From even right now, from homosexuality to unbiblical things, everyone claiming to fight for human rights, yet everything is going against Scripture. Human beings were uniquely created as in the image of God, no longer live a life that's grateful for that, but instead they are deceived by Satan and they they resent, they are jealous, and they have unbelief. They spend their entire life doing that, wasting their time. But through the atonement, of the cross through Jesus Christ Jesus has opened the way for us to be free from all of those unpleasant inclinations of our life and has given us restoration so that we may be restored to the original image by which God has created us and you have already passed through that door the important thing is for you to not be deceived. You must not be deceived. I've also driven out many demons before. And so, but this, the demon is not even some, it's not some this tremendously scary individual, but they always put on jokes, tricks. And but people are attacked by that. But when you command them in the name of Jesus Christ, they tremble in fear. They tremble in fear. And so when you call upon the name of Jesus, they tremble in fear. They're nothing. <laughs> and so when they when they work upon individuals and they start twisting their bodies or have these outward signs, it might seem like they're fearsome beings, but they're only playing tricks. They're nothing. Do not be deceived. And so, what what the devil does is he comes inside, he, he tries to just attack you here and there. He can't dwell in you because you're a temple, but he tries to deceive you once in a while here and there. So all you need to do is be aware of your uh, identity, of your authority. It is important for you to not lose hold of that. And that's why you must be spiritually awake all the time. You must always taste the blessing of being with the pulpit. All ye one believers through the pulpit, may you be able to rediscover thanksgiving and enjoy that happiness so that anyone who sees you may be able to say that you are the happiest individuals in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Father God, thank, we've greeted this Thanksgiving Lord's Day and we thank you for guiding us throughout the year and fulfilling all our needs. May we be able to give thanks today 
May we realize that complaints and unbelief is from the devil and that thanksgiving and praise is from God. May we be able to make the right choice. And for starting today, may we be within the thanksgiving and joy of salvation. And may we live boldly with the identity and the authority of children of God. And may we rediscover thanksgiving. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.